Hi, everyone. Welcome to the UConn Paul and Daisy Soros Fellowships webinar. Um, we're going to be doing a basic information session today um, just to uh, go over um, eligibility and uh, our fellowship background, um, what the fellowship covers, selection process, application process, and then any questions that um, you may have. We're uh, very happy to answer anything. Um, I'm Mika Landau. I'm the communications director. Uh, I want to thank Vincent, um, who you might see on the screen as well, uh, for hosting us. Um, if you haven't been in touch with your fellowship office, um, it's a great resource on campus. Um, you're very lucky as a school to have, um, and um, I would definitely encourage you as a next step to reach out if you haven't already. Um, so today I just want to go over the basics um, and what really makes our fellowship unique is one, it's a graduate school fellowship, but two, um, we are a fellowship for immigrants and children of immigrants. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that means because there's obviously so many categories, um, but um, we are focused on highlighting the immigrant experience. We believe in the tradition of immigrants and new Americans making outstanding contributions to the country. We think it's a very important part of our culture. Um, and our fellowship is about highlighting those contributions. And the reason that that's the case is because we were founded by two immigrants, Paul and Daisy Soros, who came from Hungary. And um, Paul was able to study engineering and uh, start an, a company. And he actually invested with his younger brother, George. George Soros, who's a very famous hedge fund manager. And, um, and so when Paul and Daisy were looking at their fortune in the 1990s, they thought, you know, how can we, what can we do to give back? And uh, Paul always said he didn't want to have his name on a building. He wanted to have a living legacy. And so that's how they decided to create this fellowship with the idea of honoring immigrants and children of immigrants, um, particularly at the graduate school level, people who had really shown that they have immense potential, um, but who also you know, need some support going to graduate school. So every year we're looking for the 30 most promising new Americans who will go on to make distinctive contributions to American society, culture, or their field. And we're really looking at the full breadth of the new American experience. So we have fellows who are writers, musicians, composers. We have artists and scientists and lawyers and engineers and CEOs. So it's the full range of ways that people are giving back. The fellowship is very much about the $90,000 that each fellow receives, but that $90,000 is meant to be a way for our fellows to take risks and to really start working on the issues that they care about most. And we also see our community, our fellows joining in this amazing community. So we hope that um, you, if you're interested in applying, you're interested in the $90,000, you're interested in taking risks so th um, with, with that financial freedom, but you're also interested in a, a community of new Americans from all over the world who are studying all different things, who are interested in intractable problems, thinking outside of the box, you're interested in talking with people who are musicians or writers or lawyers or engineers um, and being in conversation with them throughout your life about the issues that you're working on. We have 716 alums, and I just want to talk about a few of them. So if you have a few, idea, a few ideas of people who are in our community, this is Nadine Burke Harris. She was part of our very second class, a 1999 fellow, and she is now the Surgeon General of California. Um, and when you're thinking about your application, you know, we ask for people's sort of goals. And remember, we know that you don't know every job that you're going to take. You don't know every turn. Nadine Burke Harris didn't even know that the position of California Surgeon General would exist in her lifetime, and neither did we. So um, we know you you can't totally predict the future at all. We just want to hear what your broadest goals are. 
This is Vivek Murthy, a 1998 fellow, probably our most famous fellow. He was appointed Surgeon General under Barack Obama and then reappointed under President Biden, who's so the current Surgeon General of the United States. This is Fei Fei Li, so shifting to a different topic, engineering. She came from China when she was a teenager, and she had this great idea for her thesis project in 1999, which was to uh, start teaching computers how to understand images. This is, of course, um, basic technology at this point in um, our society. It's what helps us do so many things throughout the day. Uh, at, but Fei Fei really was one of the fun, like the very first leaders in this work. And one of her PhD advisors actually advised her not to do this project. They didn't think that there was a path there. Um, and certainly, Fei Fei was much smarter than everyone reviewing her application on our side. But our reviewers could see that she was thinking big. They had no idea probably what she would be doing or what she, what she was capable of. But it was so clear she was willing to take risks and she was thinking outside of the box and outside of the realm of possibility. She is now one of the great leaders of artificial intelligence and her primary focus now is on making artificial intelligence uh, centered on humans. So she's thinking about how do we not replicate all of our biases, all of our bad behaviors and give them to artificial intelligence? Um, how do we make artificial intelligence work for humans? And um, if you haven't heard of her, definitely look her up. Her TED Talk is awesome. This is Guillermo Meyer, a lawyer and um, somebody who is in California, uh, who's now the president and CEO at Public Advocates, a nonprofit civil rights law firm in San Francisco. So again, totally different field, uh, civil rights. These are just a few of the fellows in our network, but um, we have folks who are, again, musicians, writers, uh, doctors, you name it. And um, th these are some of the exciting people that you would be in community with. So the fellowship itself covers two years of graduate study in any field at any advanced degree program. So law school, master's, med school, MFAs, um, any, any type of postgraduate education. The, this is a breakdown of the funding. So the $25,000 a year in stipend support would go to you directly as the fellow. And then the $20,000 a year in tuition support would go directly to your university. We say up to $90,000 because every fellow actually work out a financial package for every fellow based on whether they have other awards or are a PhD student who is making some money um, or uh, based on their tuition. Um, and we have to sort of, we have to negotiate with every university, but we do our best to get every student that full $90,000. And some fellows don't receive much by way of a financial benefit. Um, that's not everyone. That's just a few people, usually in PhD programs, who also have the NIH or some sort of other major award. Um, but there's still a really good reason to apply for our fellowship. There's several. I mean, of course, it's a credibility builder. It's validating. Um, it will help put you on the map in, um, in terms of your field and, uh, of course, the community. It's such an amazing community to be part of. With um, uh, the community, we do want you to meet everyone. So in your first two years, you will have um, a fall conference. And this year, we're actually having it in Nashville instead of um, New York City. But this is a time for you to get to know all of the other fellows, get to know the fellowship. Uh, Daisy Soros hosts an event. You can you meet the Soros family. We bring back alumni to speak to you. It's really a great time. So who are we looking for? Um, we're looking for outstanding individuals who have a lot of promise. Um, we're not awarding you based on something you've done already. We're awarding you based on what you are 
what your potential is. So don't feel that you need to have some major, major accomplishment under your belt. Um, we're looking for demonstrated creativity, originality, or initiative. So we're looking to see that you're taking risks and that you want to have an outsized impact. Um, we know that people, um, especially new Americans, uh, have show creativity, originality, and initiative in different ways. So we might see this a lot more in your personal life than perhaps you've demonstrated in your academic and professional life so far. Um, maybe you were the first person in your uh, family to graduate from high school. Maybe you were the family translator growing up. Maybe you taught your younger siblings English. Maybe you helped them with uh, their coursework. Maybe you're the first person in your family to graduate from college. These are markers of um, the things that we're looking for. But we also see them in academic work. Perhaps you came up with a neat idea um, for a uh, political science project and you helped um, develop that and execute it. Or maybe you have an extracurricular that you're involved with on, college, on the college campus and um, you were able to bring something special to that this year. Maybe you're in a lab and you have a, a new way of a new thought about how research, you know, was being done. There's just all sorts of ways that you might demonstrate this. Again, sustained accomplishment and promise of future significant contributions, these kind of go hand in hand. We say past is prologue. So we're looking to see signals that you're somebody who has done interesting work. Um, maybe you're switching gears for, for grad school. You've, you're an English major, but now you're going to be pre-med pre or you studied um, medicine, but now you want to be a poet. Uh, we It's totally okay if your sustained accomplishments and um, the things that you've worked on are in other areas and you're now switching gears. We know you're still really young and you're still figuring out what you want to do. So um, we see, we are looking for interdisciplinary thinkers. So it's great if you, you know, have switched around and you'll bring your learning from one thing into the next field you're joining. Um, for planned graduate training that's relevant for future goals, we're just looking for folks who have, um, who really need graduate school to get them ahead. So um, I wouldn't even worry about this being part of your application. If you tell us you want to be a dentist and you're going to dental school, then that's pretty straightforward. But perhaps you want to be a policymaker on Im um, immigration and you're getting a PhD in history. We'd want to know why a PhD? Why is a PhD in necessary? Or why didn't you pick an MPP? Um, so those might be things you want to think a little bit more about in your application. And then finally, the commitment to the Constitution and Bill of Rights. This is um, something that is, of course, really important to us as a fellowship focused on immigrants. We're, you know, we're here in the U.S. Um, and what makes the U.S. special are often come back to these, these two things, the Constitution and Bill of Rights. Um, most of our applicants do not actually mention the Constitution or, or Bill of Rights in their application. So we're not looking for you to have an essay on either of these things. And we're really not looking for folks who have focused on these things exclusively. Of course, if you're going to be a lawyer, maybe you have done some voting rights or um, registered folks to vote or taken people to the polls. And those are great demonstrations of this. But, um, but you know, maybe you're a scientist and you're interested in the free inquiry of thought. Um, you know, you don't, or maybe you're in any field and you you benefit from the fact that you can be at an institution and really go after the pursuit of knowledge because just for that, for the for the joy of the pursuit of that knowledge. Um, these are special things about being in the United States. So likely this will show up in your application, whether you think about it or not. Don't worry about don't worry about it being the most obvious thing in your application. Um, if you look through the bios of our fellows, again, you'll see the people who have worked in law, it will be really obvious, but for everyone else, it's not necessarily the thing that's jumping out at them. And the director of the program, Craig Harwood, he always says too, like, have you been a good citizen of your community? Not a US citizen, but have you been a good citizen of your lab or your college or your the community you grew up in? These are also indicators of this final point.
So um, going to eligibility, um, we, we, I just want to break this down in case you haven't looked at our website. So if you are for, we have three categories for eligibility and the first is your new American status. So if you're a new, um, we're looking for new Americans and that means you can either be born abroad or you can be the child of two immigrants. And if you are born abroad, you must meet one of these categories. You must be naturalized, be a green card holder, be adopted, have refugee or asylum status, or if none of the above um, are relevant, then you must have graduated from both high school and college in the United States. So that would include DACA, undocumented students, or visa holders. So if you're a visa holder, you must have graduated from high school and college in the US. If you're naturalized or a green card holder, then you don't have to have graduated from high school or college in the US. You could have gone to school anywhere around the world. And then if you're the child of immigrants, um, we're just, it, we actually say child of immigrants, but it's okay if your parents went back to the country that you're from or they went somewhere else, maybe they're not documented or they didn't get naturalized, that's totally fine. Um, we don't need to know anything more about them. We just need to know that you were born in the US and your parents, were, when they were born, they were born abroad as non-US citizens. Um, this next category is academic standing. And so to be eligible this fall, then um, you must be planning on going to graduate school next fall in the fall of 2022. And um, that might mean that you're in your first or second year of graduate school and you'll be going, you'll continue in graduate school either in the same program you're in or a new one, um, or you're in a, um, you're applying to graduate school this fall either as an alum or, a, 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 sorry, as somebody who has their bachelor's or as a college senior. Um, so you might be a college senior applying to our fellowship this fall. You might be an alum several years out of school or just a few years out, or you might already be in a graduate program. Um, you can't defer the first year of funding from us. You must be planning on being enrolled in the fall of 2022 and the spring of 2023. We don't support online programs unless it's because of COVID, and we don't support executive or part-time programs. And that's because Paul and Daisy really wanted fellows to focus on their graduate school with the, the robust funding that they were receiving. Um, we do, um, if you're doing a joint bachelor's, master's programs, typically those are not eligible unless you are getting the bachelor's degree before you would be pursuing the graduate work as a fellow. So if you get the bachelor's degree and the graduate degree at the same time, you wouldn't be eligible. But if you get the bachelor's degree, uh, let's say this spring, then you could start the fellowship um, because those, those things would be delineated. Age, finally, we do not support anyone who is 30. You must be 30 or younger as of October 28th, and we don't make any um, exceptions to that. So you must be 30 or younger as of October 28th. Um, okay, selection process. So um, just to give you a, a little bit of a snapshot into how we're doing things. Um, we receive your application, we have readers, and then we have, um, oops, sorry, and then we have, uh, we, um, sorry, I just want to, got one question. I just want to make sure I address it on eligibility. They said they are a third year graduate school student um, and asked if they're qualified for the fellowship. And if you're in your third year this fall, then you would not be eligible unless you were applying for another graduate school program that would begin. So um, you can't have uh, started your third year um, if to, to be eligible. So thank you for that question. Um, so going back to the selection process. So we, um, we have a holistic process. Your application is always read holistically. So we're never just reading one part of your application. There are no GPA or test score cutoffs. Uh, and um, 
we are a merit-based fellowship. So going back to what I was saying earlier, um, we have a lot of different people applying with many different backgrounds. And um, because we're focused on merit, we look at merit very broadly. There are some applicants who have had every opportunity in the world um, to have traditional sort of merit achievements, such as internships or re you know research opportunities. And then we have applicants who are um, who really have not had any of those opportunities. So they, um, you know, in the summer times, they have to probably take a job that doesn't necessarily have to do with their academic or professional work. They might be helping a loved one um, or helping their parents. Uh, their parents haven't had the experience to help them with college or graduate school. So these are all things that we're trying to take into account for each applicant. And when we're reading their application, we're saying, okay, what, broadly speaking, what are the opportunities and obstacles they've faced? So for somebody who has a traditional um, application where they have had sort of all the internships and the research opportunities, we're really excited about that applicant, but they have kind of every opportunity to succeed um, on the application in a traditional way. For folks who have not had every opportunity, I would really encourage you to make sure you're sharing with us in your essays um, sort of a sense of the obstacles that you have faced so that we know how to read your application and your achievements based on the successes that you've had so far. Um, so it, we can't do that unless we sort of know a little bit more about you. So, you know, if you are a first generation high school or college graduate, and we do ask um, that you can share more in your essays as well. Um, we don't have any quotas. So if somebody from the University of Connecticut gets a, you know, this year, we can have somebody from University of Connecticut get it next year. We could have 10 this year. Um, and if somebody is a violin player from the University of Connecticut um, this year, we could have four violin players from the University of Connecticut. That's usually, um, it, yeah, we have no quotas. There's no, there's, we're not taking anybody out. And actually, um, if somebody in your field got the fellowship recently, I think that's usually a very good sign because it means that the reviewers see the field as particularly exciting or a place where somebody could make a lot of contribution in the, in the future. Um, here's a breakdown of the application process. Um, feel free to ask any questions in the Q&A uh, if you have them. But um, we, the application is online. We don't take anything by email or um, by snail mail. And the, it starts out with some demographic questions about you and your family. Answer them to the best of your knowledge. Then um, and for your educational background, we do ask if you've gone to community college. Um, and if you have, then you should provide a transcript for that, it, um, even if it was just in high school or something like that, as long as it's not on your University of Connecticut transcript. Um, for your resume, we're looking for a one to two page resume or CV. We do see longer. It just depends on, on what your um, what you want to provide. Remember that your resume and your CV will go, or your CV will go into the interview with you. So um, don't provide anything that you wouldn't want to talk about in your interview. Uh, so that somebody could just point to a project from three years ago and say, oh, tell me about this. Like if it's not something that you wouldn't want to talk about in an interview, then maybe it shouldn't be on your resume. I think that's a good sniff test. Of course, Again, like some projects that may not be relevant to what you're working on or want to work on, they they might still be really important to you. And again, we love interdisciplinary thinkers. So if there is a cool project you worked on that doesn't have necessarily like total connection, that's fine. Um, but again, just it should be something you are really excited about or you are excited about and that you would want to talk about and share more about. So um, transcripts, as I said, we're looking for your undergraduate transcripts and your graduate school transcripts. If you just started grad school and you don't have any grades, that's fine. The transcript still is a way of showing us that you're enrolled or what classes you're taking. Um, these can be screenshots because they don't have to be official transcripts since you're uploading them yourself. 
test scores, we are looking for the test score that was required for your graduate program. Some graduate schools don't require a test score, and during COVID, um, several dropped that requirement. So if you don't have a test score that was required, that's fine. If you're taking the test after the October 28th deadline, that's also totally fine. We know plenty of people do that. Now, getting into the two essays and our optional exhibits and the recommendations, this is really the heart of the application. So the two essays, the, the first is um, tell us about your new American experience, and the second is to tell us about um, your goals and how you would like to make an impact. Why are you going to graduate school? So let's start with that first essay, the new American essay. Um, this essay should be a personal essay. It should be about your story and your, it, perhaps your family's story. Um, it should be about how you feel about being a new American and what it means to you to be here. Uh, it should be something that only you can write. Um, it may be something that's pretty personal and you don't feel super comfortable sharing it with others, but you are welcome to share drafts of the essays with others um, who you feel comfortable sharing it with. With. And um, we encourage you to do that to get feedback, especially from somebody like your fellowship advisor or a professor or somebody that um, really understands these personal essays well. Um, this, um, this essay does not need to be a five-star review of the new American experience. In fact, we see a lot of people critique um, some of the experiences they've had. Um, they, this can be, this doesn't have to be a resolved essay. You don't know, you don't need to have a perfectly fine pointed um, understanding of what it means to be a new American. I'm sure it's still something that you're thinking about um, and as you go. Um, but what, what I would encourage you to do for this essay is to reflect back on your life, um, to think about what it was like to live in another country or for your parents or grandparents to live in another country, to think about what it means to live here, to think about the memories of growing up either somewhere else or here um, that stand out when you think about what it means to be a new American. Um, and I think about, you know, what connections has that, what influence has that had on your, um, on who you are, on how you live here in the United States, maybe even on your career path and how you've chosen what, what you've chosen. Um, there's so many different ways that you can go about this essay. We don't provide templates because we love the creativity that people bring. Um, you know, many of our fellows, English is not their first language, so don't feel that this needs to be the perfect essay. Um, we're not going to dock you um, for, you know, not for like, for, for that sort of typical things. Um, but we still want to see, we want to see that you've worked really hard on this. This should probably be something that has taken a few drafts. So give yourself time and space to think, um, think about it. Um, the second essay is, a, is, you know, a more straightforward essay. What are your goals? Why are you going to graduate school? Why did you pick the graduate school you're in? Or what are the characteristics of the graduate programs that you're applying to? Um, you know, you don't need to tell us the, the exact thing that you want to be doing in a few years, but what are the questions that you hope to be tackling either in graduate school or after graduate school? What are the types of positions that you want? Put away your imposter syndrome. You know, if you could imagine being Surgeon General, like tell us that. Um, we're not going to hold you hold you to it at all. Um, and remember that we're looking for that outsized impact. So if you want to be a doctor and you tell us that you're going to be opening a doctor's office and treating patients, that's really nice. And there's it's a really lovely goal, but we're interested in how you're going to have an outsized impact. How are you going to um, treat, how are you going to have more of an impact than other doctors doing that would? Maybe it's that you're treating a really specific population that hasn't had access to the best healthcare. And so you will be disseminating knowledge of best practices as you go. Um, or maybe it's that you're going to get into policy or you um, want to start offering healthcare in a way that has never been done before, that's more affordable. Um, there's so many different approaches, but we need to understand that so that we can understand what that impact would be. Um, 
and uh, going to recommendations, you can have, or sorry, I'll, I skipped optional exhibits. Optional exhibits are optional. You don't need to put anything there and they're optional for our readers. So if you do put something there, our readers do not need to follow the link or read the whole thing. Um, but it is a great place to round out your application. Maybe it's a photo of your family from when you immigrated, or um, maybe it's an article about how you also play the flute and there's a concert that you were in. Um, maybe it's a link to a performance that you did because you're um, a theater director. Maybe you're an architect or an artist and you want to provide examples of your work. So there's all sorts of things that can go here, research papers, examples of presentations, a website you worked on. The most important thing is that this section is well organized, that it's not another essay, that it's not another recommendation, and um, that you're organizing things in sort of the order of importance. So if um, if you really want somebody to go to your personal website, make that the first thing that is on the optional exhibits. And then again, each thing should have just one or two sentences that contextualizes it. So um, I'm providing a link to my personal website so that you can see um, my portfolio of artwork. Um, here's the link. So if you just provide a link and you don't tell, tell the readers what they're going to, they probably don't want to click that link. Um, so just remember to provide context. And if you are the co-author of something, make sure that you, you know, you just make that clear. It's totally fine. Even if you don't, um, uh, even if, yeah, it's, to it's totally fine. And, um, and if you're you were working on a research paper and it might be published, um, we see that that's totally fine. But just make sure it's clear that something you know hasn't been approved; it's just been submitted or where, wherever it is, kind of in the in the process. So finally, looking at recommendations, we require three to five recommendations, and it will each each applicant sort of might want to consider a different approach to their recommendations. Um, in general, if, let's say you're an undergraduate right now, we're probably going to expect most of your recommendations to be from undergraduate uh, professors or advisors. If you are 10 years out of the of undergrad, then we would expect for most of your recommendations to be non-undergraduate recommenders. If you're going to business school, we're going to expect maybe somebody from a work experience um, to be recommending you. If you're going to a PhD, we're going to expect somebody that might have some sense of your research capabilities. If you are going to an MFA program. We'll want to see somebody who can speak to that. So it, it just really depends on who you are and where you are. But um, in general, you want people who know you, who are really enthusiastic about you. And you might want to sit down with your recommenders or just email, give them an overview of what the fellowship is. If your recommenders don't know that you're a new American or they don't know your new American story, it's worth probably giving them what you're comfortable sharing so that they know why this fellowship is important. Um, tell them that you're excited to join a community of new Americans. Um, tell them about some of the people that are in the community, get them excited about the opportunity with you. Um, and then you may wanna think about the things that you're hoping that they highlight and maybe even encourage them to highlight, highlight those things. So thinking about ways that you've taken initiative or um, shown originality. Uh, if, if, a, if a recommender, if the whole point of the recommender recommendation is for somebody to just say like, this person's really nice, that's, that's not necessarily going to get you the fellowship. So you really want to help make sure that people are talking about the way that you have taken initiative um, or done something that's, you know, that or the, the way that you have a lot of potential, you know, in your work in class. Um, there might be some personal recommendations, so maybe a pastor or um, a rabbi or somebody that you know through your religious life. Maybe it's somebody that in the community you grew up with. Um, maybe it's a nonprofit you uh, volunteer with. Maybe it's an extracurricular that you work in. Maybe you're a teacher and you have a student recommend you. Maybe it's a colleague. There's just, there's all sorts of ways that you can go. Um, so, 
have some fun with your recommendations, make sure that there are people who are really enthusiastic about you um, and talk to your fellowship advisor for, for uh, making sure you have a good list. Um, just quickly on our application deadline, we don't make any exceptions to the deadline. So no matter what happens, we will not extend the deadline. So be sure to get it in on time. We do have several reserve, uh, rec uh, we do have several resources online. Uh, we have a mailing list, a, a digital mailing list that you can sign up for for our weekly fellows in the news email, um, which just sort of highlights all of the news stories our fellows were in each or uh, every week. And then we also have a newsletter um, that you can sign up for that's monthly. I would check out our Instagram page in particular if you're on social media, but all of the all of the social media pages are great. Our, right now we have a fellow, Pooja, who's a 2021 fellow who's taken over our Instagram account. She's sharing her story. So it's a great way to just hear about one fellow. But don't get imposter syndrome because I know that happens. You're like, oh my gosh, this person goes to Harvard Med School and look at all the things she's done. But remember that you will be there and um, and everybody at Harvard and everybody at Yale all have imposter syndrome too. So uh, there's no, do not take yourself out of this game, uh, apply and um, and just put your, you know, your most confident foot forward. So these are the ways that you can get started um, on your application if you haven't already, but I'd love to just open it up for questions. And um, Vince, do you have any other uh, things that you would recommend? No, I, the only thing I'd reiterate is I think actually jumping on social media and following uh, the organization is a good way to make it real. Uh, I think that yeah. we underestimate the power of that sometimes, but it reminds you get you, you all have a really great presence on on Instagram in particular is the one I'm familiar with, and I think it just it's one way of feeling like you're part of this and making it real and keeping it in front of your mind. Because with the application deadline about a month away, people are going to need to block out time in their week to dedicate to this. This isn't the kind of thing that can be put together last night. Yeah, absolutely. Um... So um, yeah, what questions do folks have? I know, don't be shy, this is a great, a great time to um, ask questions. You can do it in the chat or in the Q&A. Um, I will give you a few seconds to think about, um, about questions if you don't have any, but, um, but yeah, I'll, I'll put in the chat, let's see. Um, yeah, I'm going to put in my email. It's mlandau at pdsoros.org. So if you want to ask any questions, just reach out to me and um, I will um, be happy to help you. Um, and for anybody who's watching this recorded, it's mlandau at pdsoros.org. Okay, so we have two questions. Feel free to keep the questions coming. One is, what is the post-application interview process? And another question is, would I be eligible if both me and my parents receive citizen citizenship after refugee status? So I'll start with that second question. Um, yes, you would be eligible, absolutely, if both you and your parents receive citizenship after refugee status. Um, so if, yeah, uh, so that that is um, totally um, great and congratulations. Um, and then um, for the first question, which is a really great one, what is the post-application interview process? Okay, so you submit your application. We don't review your applications until after that October 28th deadline. So um, you won't hear from us um, for a little while because that we just go into review process mode. Um, then in early January of 2022, I can't believe it's already 2022, uh, or it will be. Um, in early January, we will uh, go over, um, we will reach out to everybody who applied, and we will let 77 people know if they were chosen as, or that they were chosen as finalists, and we'll let everybody else know that they are not moving on in the process. And then, um, at that point, for the 77 finalists, it's private. You, you, you could tell your folks, but we don't, that's not a public process. And then um, we give you about a month and then we're going to have 
virtual interviews this year because of COVID, but um, in the past they were in person. And um, we, what we'll do is sort of set up a day where you'll have two interviews with two with a pan, each interview will be with a different panel. Um, and each interview is 30 minutes. So um, that will be in late January or, or early February. And the panels will be made up of people who are from all different um, academic backgrounds or professional backgrounds and at sort of all different stages. So you might be a, um, I don't know, you might be an architect talking to a group of lawyers and doctors and engineers and scientists and maybe one architect. Um, and you really are going to have to think about how to present yourself in a way that is exciting for all of those people. And um, you'll be thinking about um, how do I show them that my work has the most potential for impact? How, how can I show them that my abilities has the most potential for outsized impact? And the interviews can really range. They can be about your professional and academic background, but they can also be about your personal story. Usually um, it's sort of whatever the panelists have, they'll read through your whole application. Um, and then it's sort of wherever they have questions. So, you know, it's like, if there's something that you didn't talk about um, or they want to hear more about, that's what they'll ask you questions on. So it's very natural. The questions are not the same for everybody. Uh, it just really depends on the panelists and the finalists themselves. Um, but yeah, so two 30 minute interviews. Um, we really try to hold your hand. We are very, it's a very supportive interview process. We want you to get the fellowship. And um, after those two interviews, you won't hear from us until about mid March. And then we let all the finalists know whether they got the fellowship or not. And then for those who do get the fellowship, we announce it in April with a New York Times ad and then, and with hopefully articles for. The, at the schools you're at. Um, and then the fellowship really begins in the fall of 2022. So that's a little bit of the walkthrough of the process. Um, and I'm happy to answer more questions about that. Does anybody else have any questions um, about the application process, the selection process? Um, okay, will the initial application reviewers have a similar makeup to the panelists, i.e. people of all professional backgrounds? Will they also be new Americans? Great questions. So I would say we don't make the list of reviewers public. I would say that a majority of them are new Americans um, from all different backgrounds and they will be like the panelists and that they will have um, all different all different backgrounds. So if, you know, at the beginning of our application, we asked you sort of what category of work you do, but we actually don't use that to review your application. So you're, you could get somebody who is not at all a subject matter um, expert to read your application. That said, we will definitely have subject matter experts for most people um, at some point reading their application. Um, so it just sort of depends, um, you know, it, it, it depends where that will be in the process. But you could have somebody, who, the first reader could be somebody that is, you know, an expert. I will say with the readers, everybody who's a reader is really an expert in graduate education um, to some degree, in addition to whatever else they're an expert in. But these are not people that are unfamiliar with sort of PhDs and um, law, law degrees, master's degrees. These are people that kind of know this uh, part of life well. They understand what kinds of decisions people are making, what kind of contributes to those. So um, the nice thing is that people are not too far away from sort of where you are in your in your path. Um, I don't know if that is helpful, but um, another question, uh, if we're taking the GRE in the next month or so, can we still submit those scores after, after the deadline has passed? Yes, you can. Um, you can definitely submit. I think once you get into December, it's uh, not that helpful because we're pretty far along in the process. So you've, you're, you may have, you know, we may be a finalist, um, it, but so I don't don't feel like that's going to make or break your application though. Regardless, like 
it, because, you know, a great GRE score is really nice, but it's not going to get you the fellowship. Um, and we can kind of see, you know, a score is a GRE is, is, uh, we know that every, especially for a GRE, everybody puts different levels of energy into that depending on their program. So, you know, some graduate programs really care about GRE scores and others don't. Whereas somebody who's taking the MCAT probably is studying a lot for the MCAT or somebody who's taking the LSAT is probably studying a lot. Um, again, even if you don't like have the MCAT or LSAT score of your dream, that's totally fine. We also know those are just one, like one factor. So um, don't worry too much about having that. Um, trying to think, yeah, I would definitely encourage everyone to go to our website and check out the Meet the Fellows page. And then in that search bar, you can just search for um, th any, anything that you're interested in. Let's say you're interested in public health, just put public health in, the, in quotes, and you will see a bunch of different fellows pop up who are in your field. Uh, and then I don't know. Yeah. And, and check out people who excite you or, um, or, and it just as a way of learning about them, we've up, we try to keep all the bios updated. Some are more updated than others though. So there are usually LinkedIn links if you want to just kind of make, you know, see their more up-to-date, um, view, but that's a, a really helpful way also to get to know fellows. Um, I do help work on the first year bios. Our goal with those bios are to talk about how great immigrants are. So again, um, they can be intimidating, but the goal is to talk about how great they are. And I, I can definitely write an equally um, amazing bio for you that would make you blush. So um, don't, again, don't be intimidated by the bios. That's, you know, that's part of our mission is to talk about how great new Americans are. Um, not that our goal is not to be intimidating. <laughs> Um, any other questions or are, are people feeling excited to apply? I would love to hear like if anybody is applying, you can just, you know, type it in the chat. Um, Nika, can I ask a question? Yes, please. Have there been any sort of systematic mistakes or things, omissions, things that maybe shouldn't be included that you see showing up time and again in applications? You know, I think you, it's, hard to share too much because we're such a personal fellowship. So I would say it's kind of the opposite. It's like the more you share, probably the, like the better. Um, I think in the, just in that first new American essay, making sure that it's personal to you and your experience, um, you know, again, like taking the time to talk to like relatives or loved ones or people that knew you when you immigrated or knew your family. Um, a lot of times, if your parents are the ones that immigrated, I've heard from so many fellows, like they thought they knew why their parents immigrated. And then they really asked like really asked. <laughs> um, and uh, instead of just kind of getting the kind of you know, easier answer that their parents have, like, yeah, they start to get into a few more specifics. And um, a lot of fellows have learned a lot from writing those essays. Um, but yeah, so it, you know, I'd say just, you know, make it personal. Um, and let's see, I, and I think, you know, Oh, I, I guess the, when it comes to expertise, you know, we were, somebody was just asking about who's going to be reading their application. That I think is a really tricky um, needle to thread because you do need to speak to different audiences in your application. Um, but, you know, remember that there are like people do know their limits. So if you do start talking about something that they're not experts in, they're going to totally give you the, you know, they're, they're going to say like, okay, I don't quite understand this, but I like, I kind of get the point, but obviously make sure that you're giving them the overarching um, information that helps that like, okay, this person is interested in this type of science or this type of law. And Overall, this is what they're working on so that they can latch on to it and really understand the narrative so that when you do go a little bit more specific and it's kind of, you know, beyond um, their realm of expertise, they can kind of say like, that's okay, I don't need to understand this because their recommendations are great, their resume is great, their essays are great, like I'm going to move this person, you know, along in the process. Um, 
And uh, yeah, and at, you know, at the same rate with expertise, you don't need to know it all. Um, you are really early on in your career and you are going to be talking to people that, um, that have all sorts of expertise and knowledge. Um, and so um, I would, you know, think, think more about the questions that you have instead of trying to prove that you're the greatest expert, you know, try to prove that you're the best learner um, and that you have the best questions and that you have the best process for learning and taking that learning and making it important. You know, instead of trying to prove that you're the smartest person, try to prove that, you know, you understand what questions to ask and maybe, you know, you don't know everything. Like, you know, I think there's kind of a balance there um, of just making sure that, you know, you don't feel like you're, you have to be the, yeah, the biggest ex knowledge expert um, because your resume and your research and your, um, the things that you've done, they will kind of speak to the fact that you are knowledgeable. Um, you don't need to write an essay where you're trying to prove that. Um, I don't know if that, if that makes sense. Um, but yeah, Vin, does that, do you ever see that? Absolutely. I think that because of the nature of the questions that I get asked, right, we generally when we write essays, and there's a question, we want to answer it. And sometimes it takes a minute for people to remember that, no, the reason I'm applying for this is because I, this is what I know I need to learn. This is why this is a perfect opportunity for me um, as I continue down this, this journey. And also recognizing that, um, as you said, you're not going to come back in 10 years and say, you know, in your essay, you said you would do this. You know, what's, what's the deal? That yeah. obviously, if you're fortunate enough to be successful in a competition like this, when it actually opens of new opportunities yeah. that might not have been available before. So the irony of it is that the very act of, you know, sort of receiving the, the award might actually make you less likely to do the, exactly the things you said you were going to do in your application. So it's just a funny, don't get too caught up in that. Don't let that Yeah, happen. that is such a astute insight. Um, you know, the, the, yeah, the, the, these things that broaden your horizons will likely change your path. So, um, yeah, we, we total, yeah, don't get, yeah, don't feel that you need to defend a certain path because we know that you might change your mind. Um, and we know that extraordinary thinkers are pat and people who are passionate are passionate sometimes about more than one thing. I mean, we've had people who have applied and said that they want to do a PhD in, you know, religious studies, and then they're doing, it turns out at the last minute they switch and they do um, something different and they're very successful at both things. And, you know, that's great. Like, don't, don't feel afraid of that. Um, and, uh, you know, afraid of, of that passion. So I don't see any more questions. So uh, I guess I will wrap this up. But I just want to thank everybody. We're so excited about the University of Connecticut. Um, I'm a big fan of the school. I know there are so many amazing students um, at every level, graduate, undergraduate, and certainly the alumni. So um, please, please apply. And um, I really look forward to reading your application. And well, I won't read it, uh, but I will hopefully read it once you're a fellow. <laughs> and, um, and then, you know, but hopefully we will receive it and I will look forward to that. So thank you so much for hosting us. We really appreciate it. Have a thank great day. Yep.